Hey everybody, Justin here with From Zero to Studio, and I have a very special video for you today. Our guest is an award-winning music creator, producer, engineer, and entrepreneur, Lisa Patterson. Lisa owns and operates a recording studio in Toronto, Canada, and she's been the director, presenter, curator, and host for tons of panels and music production workshops. She was the founder of Her Studio, H-E-R, which stands for Heroes of Engineering and Record Production. And this workshop was created to provide a safe space for women and non-binary producers to learn and collaborate with their peers in the industry. She's a huge advocate for inclusion and equity and has championed these values across four continents for over 25 years. Most recently, her passion for music production has led her to create a music producer showcase called The Listening Party, along with an artist development program, which provides one-on-one -on -one studio and live performance coaching for performing artists, songwriters, and producers. Lisa has been involved in so many areas of the music industry and has such an impressive list of career highlights that we'd have to create a mini-series just to cover it all. At that, here is my inspiring conversation with Lisa Patterson. All right, I am here with the wonderful Lisa Patterson. How are you doing today? Great, how are you? Good, thank you so much for joining me. Um, so I'm in Michigan and you're up in Toronto, correct? That's correct. Yeah. So it's we're, same time zone, but a little bit further north than I am. And yeah. uh, what's what, same winter weather? It's <laughs> similar weather. We we still got this uh, lingering um, uh, spring frozen winter time. If you it's like 20 degrees here, which is whatever in Celsius below zero for you. <laughs> yeah, I'm ready. I think a lot of people are ready to see the little buds come out of the earth. You know. Right. Well. As far as things that are not winter up in Toronto, in the music scene up there, what's heating up with that? What's the music scene like up there for you? Well, like everybody, you know, the pandemic really screeched the live sector to a halt. So I'm happy to report that it's slowly coming back online. Um, several clubs are uh, getting busy again. I just went to an event at the Opera House, which is a very large, um, well, it's a concert theater not as big as like a stadium, but also not like a small club. And one of the things that they did that was really encouraging was during the pandemic, and it, I mean, it's a stalwart club. It's been going like decades and they invested in this heavy duty new lighting and, and sound um, to sort of position themselves for coming out of the pandemic. And as a big risk, but it's paying off because the show was spectacular. The sound and lights were amazing. Um, so some people have done that. They've tried to make the most of it. We had some government assistance um, through, uh, we have like a, it's called Factor, the foundation um, to support recorded music also does help some of the live sector. We have provincial and federal government um, funding that was trying to help the clubs survive, but a lot of them closed. A lot of the smaller ones closed. Um, yeah, and then the recording sector, it's its a little better for sure. Like studios, the really big studios survived. Um, sort of mid-range mid studios, some didn't. And a lot of people like me that have uh, my own live work space with my ISO booth and my Star Trek Enterprise desk, which you can't see, it's in front of me. <laughs> Love um, it. People like myself, um, of course, like everybody around the world, a lot of us were working remotely. Um, but, you know, the scene in Toronto is very strong. It's very diverse musically. A lot of um, a full range of genres from pop to rock to hip hop to folk to jazz to world and roots. And it's very diverse. Um, and in terms of the rest of Canada, like it's probably the, if you want to play live as an artist, it's the city to be in, in Canada. It definitely, despite the live sector being hurt by the pandemic, it's definitely a place with the most happening live scene. I think this is a positive bit of a segue here. I warned you, I was going to segue, <laughs> um, but that one thing that does seem to be happening up here, I don't know about in the U S but a lot of artists and producers, engineers, people in the industry who are out there slogging it out um, are starting to very openly put wellness first and talk about mental health, physical health, and not wanting to tour in that grueling way and wanting to, you know, make sure that it's it's not sort of, you know, at the cost of everything to um, 
you know, to get out there and, and make your art happen. Of course, that is helped by being able to do so much online with, you know, promotion and streaming and, and live video, um, which, of course, boomed in the pandemic. Um, so what about you? What about your background? What's kind of like your musical background and where did you uh, how did you get involved with all of this? All this crazy music business. <laughs> uh, well, I'm from the West Coast of Canada. I'm from British Columbia. And I guess it comes from two influences. One is my training in classical piano as a young kid at five, five years old. And also my dad was a big fan of vinyl and music and he was always spinning. Well, he probably didn't call it spinning then, but uh, he was always putting on the Beatles, Cat Stevens, uh, Bob Dylan, Joni Mitchell, like classic uh, music. And it just embedded itself in my head to this day. There'll be a, a melody or a song that you know, comes on and I just flash back to being in our Land Rover driving through the Northern British Columbia, like landscape. Um, so when I uh, was taking piano lessons, um, it was classical. I don't think anyone really knew any better. It was not as hip as it is now. Um, and I liked it actually. I didn't mind doing scales and etudes and arpeggios. It just felt good on my hands. Um, but I didn't like the stress of the Royal Conservatory exams. If you study classical as a kid, um, there's, you don't have to, but there's this like grade one, grade two sort of series. And it's all like, it gets increasingly more difficult. And the way you move up is with these exams in front of this adjudicator who seems like the most intimidating person. It's all very stressful. So there was a part of me that just loved playing piano I have the same baby grand piano that my parents got me when I was five. And I know they pinched the pennies to get that piano for me. I've had it restored and, you know, fixed. That's incredible. Uh, I know, right? It's like I've poured all my blood, sweat and tears into that piano writing songs for years. Anywho, um, I think I lost the feeling of release and, and freedom when uh, the pressure of doing well on these exams became too much. And I started to discover pop and rock music. So I guess I was about 13. And I started trying to figure out like, well, how do they know how to do this? How do they know what to play? And it was very mysterious to me. Then I went, uh, it was in high school, early high school, played flute and alto saxophone uh, in the stage band. And I really got into that sort of like, feel of like swing and vibes. Um, and I continued playing saxophone all throughout playing bands. And then it was like the epiphany was I knew I wanted to do something in music. I didn't want to go to university and be a teacher, <laughs> like an educator, nothing against that. I ended up teaching privately for many years. I have great admiration for teachers. Music teachers have changed my life in such a positive way. I've also had some music teachers, by the way, who slapped my hands with a freaking ruler. Like oh, that's no. a Oh yeah. It, anyway, but the thing that changed everything was walking into Fanshawe College, which offers a recording, um, recording engineering and music production three-year program. I saw it in a in a you know book at at the high school because I was like, I don't want to go to university, but how am I gonna like be involved in sound? And I saw this course and I'm like, damn, that's, that's it. That's it for me. Um, and the reason that I knew it was sound is because when I was about eight or nine years old, I took my dad's, uh, he had this like realistic uh, cassette deck, like that had like the white and red, like the play and record button side by side. Okay. And it had a little realistic microphone that you plugged in. And I would like walk around our farm and like record the animals and the machinery. And like, I just was fascinated by sound. And so you were creating had a, sample libraries before they were cool. 100%. <laughs> and check this out. I was editing on the fly because the, the, the mic had a little off on switch. And I was like, you know, people thought I was going to be a journalist because I would be like, the mic would be off and I would ask them a question and then I put the mic in their face right before they answered. I turned the mic on so that I would only get their answer because I wanted to get the answers all lined up one. And, yeah, that's awesome. 
So, yeah, so I was always into the sonic thing. And so when I walked into my first year, I was 19 years old, fresh out of high school, and I heard this jam and I recognized it from my dad's albums. It's like a Santana slow song called Samba Pati. And it's like this famous kind of guitar melody. Anyway, I'm like, oh my God, this is so cool. Like, I know that song. So I walk in and there's an electric guitarist, a drummer and a bassist. And remember, I, like I've only played classical music to this point and saxophone and swing band. Like, okay, I, I know nothing about pop music. And they said, oh, hi. And I was like, hi, hey. And they're like, oh, do you play? And I'm like, yeah. And they're like, what do you play? And I was like, a piano. And they were like, well, there's one right there. Have a seat. So there's this grand piano in the room. And I didn't know any better. I just was like, well, I guess I better just go sit there. <laughs> so I went and sat down. And this was the epiphany for me. I looked at the keyboard. I looked at my hands. And the guitarist yelled, we're in E minor. And I was like, great. Um, do I play arpeggios? Do I play the E minor hot scale? Like, I felt this incredible dread and sort of and, and an epiphany of I've missed something how how do I not know how to do this what was the gap in my education my music education that didn't prepare me so was it that you just you froze up on the spot or it was something that you just couldn't pull uh, pull from your head right away I didn't know how to do it I didn't know how to jam. Like now, if you say we're jamming an E minor, I'm the one who's like veering off using all the like wild extensions and stuff. But at the time, I didn't even know what that meant. I didn't even know that you could make up a song on the spot using chords and chord progressions. Like it was still all a mystery to me. So then I went deep into it. Uh, then I played band in bands and I learned all about comping and voice leading and chord progressions and songwriting. I'd been writing poetry since a very young age. I had tons of journals full of, I called them songs, but I didn't know how to make chords and songs. So all of it converged. And by the time I got out of college, uh, I was touring. I toured for about 10 years in different original music bands across three different continents, had a blast, played in all kinds of great music. I also took my own band on tour through Europe and India. Like I, I love touring, but um, as the, all the years were kind of going by, I'm like, I don't know. I think I, I think I really want to come back to my sonic architecture. <laughs> um, and that's, yeah. So that's my background. Your entire musical background helped to shape where you're at and how you can help other artists and develop them into singer and songwriters. As far as when you approach working with these artists, kind of what's your what's your process like when you uh, when you have an artist in your studio? Um, I mean, there is kind of a, a general standard of pre-production, tracking, bed tracking, vocals, track building, although that has changed from back in the day because it used to be, oh, get the rhythm section in the studio and you get the bed tracks. And then later you add the singer, whereas now, and I love this because of, Technology, I love centering the song around the vocal. It's all about the singer. It's all about the vocal. So um, I like to have a kind of a hangout. It's, you know, because of the pandemic has been a lot video, but now in real life again. Um, just find out, I guess it's sort of what designers call a discovery meeting. You know, you figure out where are they at? What are they looking to achieve? Um, how How much experience do they have? Um, what's their vision? Maybe they don't have one yet. And, you know, uh, references are a producer's best friend. So I always ask them, you know, who do you aspire to? What kind of sounds? In the end, I want them to find their own unique sonic signature. And I do believe everyone has one. Um, but it's sort of, it takes a bit of effort to kind of dig in. It, it There's a trust that has to be there. So it doesn't always come to the front right away. I'm also an engineer and I do freelance uh, on projects, people will bring me in to do just engineering um, or just production, uh, or I do song camps. But I, I actually, I love the the triple threat. <laughs> I like being in that control seat <laughs> of uh, the creative musical produ producer side. And then I love editing my own stuff. It's kind of a happy place. 
Uh, so I love the engineering thing and, um, and the songwriting, you know, I'm, I'm very sensitive to melody and phrases and lyrics. So I do help the artists in that way, but we talk about it in advance. I say, look, I don't want, don't let me mess with your art. If your song has some like, you know, stream of consciousness and I'm saying, where's the chorus? And you say, there's no chorus. I'm going to be like, well, okay. Who's your target audience? I know it sounds like such an industry question, but it's my job as a producer to ask that question. And if they're like, I don't care, I don't have one. I'll be like, okay, is this for you, your family, your friends, or is this a release you want to promote yourself and have a career? Do you want to be known as a songwriter specifically and potentially have your tracks placed or, you know, in sync or with other artists? Or are you going to want to go out there and tour it and like this is representing you? And so I have to drill down and find out all that information really informs where we're going to go. And then we talk about budget a little bit. Money is always the uncomfortable side of it. But you got to I've learned so the hard way you got to get it out off the top. And uh, like many of us, like yourself, you know, I have my policies and my information in documents. So I share them with the artist. Then once we can sort of dust our hands off and go, let's make some music, uh, then it's a production, uh, pre-production, and they'll come here and we'll generally kind of mess around. I'll play piano or keyboards or guitar, acoustic guitar. I'm not an electric guitarist. And just want to like find where does the song sit tempo-wise and key. The tempo and the key are my first and foremost. I generally will ask the artist, even if they play an instrument as well, if they've written it with chords, I'll ask them to just walk around freely and sing it and sing the lines so I can really feel where the groove or where the pocket is. Um, you know, because sometimes people with the limitations of their instrument or maybe because of their incredible skill with their instrument they play too many notes or they play it kind of fast or kind of slow so I want to find it always come back to the voice find where it sits in the voice and then I will track just with a b uh, just with a bpm click I'll just track them singing it a little bit get them sort of you know in the booth kind of feeling how that feels so they get kind of used to the the zone in here and uh, then we'll like get an instrument, maybe their instrument, piano or guitar, or I'll use synth and MIDI, or I'll use, I'll play, you know, if it's actually a more traditional acoustic kind of song, then I'll play the chord progression. It's a sketch. It's sort of like a ghost bed track. Okay. And then we get, um, I guess you would call it a ghost vocal on the track just so I can hear them fully you know realize the song and then I ask them to leave it with me and what I do is I I listen to it on repeat I might just snip around a little bit change some of the arrangements try like oh maybe there should be a longer event space before the bridge or you know kind of mess with the arrangement maybe do a little bit of track building like if we've talked about they really want some bass or they they'd like to have some horns or the, you know, drums, whatever. So then I'll design parts a little bit and then they'll come back and we'll listen and we'll talk about it, kind of get it a little more landed. Um, and then we do the for real vocal and we actually invest a full, you know, day or three hours and a break, another two or three hours. I need at least a minimum of three hours for a lead vocal. Um, and then I've got a comp and edit. Sometimes I'd say, well, let, let's stop there. You, you go home and let me comp this. And then they come back and do, you know, background vocals. Sure. But yeah. once we have that final lead, then I'm comfortable saying, okay, you want to bring in like a top acoustic guitar player. This is going to be like a pop tune driving acoustic guitar. I know the person. I've got lots of good connections in Toronto. I'll call up somebody. They'll either come here or I'll go to their space. Um, so the artist puts that in my hands. I've done many times. And we track parts and I put them into the track. And then the artist hears it and signs off. And we just go from there and we keep building. So sometimes it's um, pretty straight ahead. And other times I've had people who don't actually play chordal instruments. Mm -hmm they have melody and lyric. And so I'm playing a 
much bigger role. It's more high maintenance in terms of do you, do you want an A minor or a C major? Like, you know, so <laughs> it, yeah. So I basically, um, you know, this term doula, uh huh, like having a, like a nurse helping you have a baby. Right. Right. So I've been playing around with this, like a producer doula thing, because <laughs> I feel like I'm like helping them, you know, have this baby. And, uh, it's, it's sometimes difficult and painful, uh, I try to make it as smooth and painless as possible, but, um, you know, it's, it's not unheard of to have an artist burst into tears in the mic on in front of the mic, not because of anything I've done or said, but because they're accessing a deep part of themselves and it's a dream of theirs. And so I have to be sensitive to that. So it's an interesting way to put that being, being the doula, because that's the musical project for an artist is your baby. It is your, your child that you're working on that you put your all into. Um, mm -hmm. And it's not something that everybody can do on their own and having that outside perspective of just a different approach to maybe how we enter to the chorus or maybe a different backing vocal to go along. And it sounds like you're very hands on with the projects as well, from everything from the discovery calls to finding out the exact artist vision. And that's huge yeah. to have that for, for those that you're working with. And it only helps to make those projects go along much smoother because you know exactly what the outcome should be from the start when you first start talking. And and vocal production, especially in the past five or 10 years, has really risen to be clear to people that vocal production is a crucial thing to be able to um, focus on. And it's a craft unto itself. And I feel really proud of how I'm able to help people with that as a vocal producer, because I've been in the booth. I've been that person behind the mic. I know that how much you're carrying, how much you have to do tracking the lyrics, pulling the emotion, uh, staying relaxed, having the technical and the creative and the emotional all lined up. So I love vocal production. I'm also kind of old school in that because I do work mostly with building a track digitally, it might sound like, oh, it's more like electronic pop, but I come from being an acoustic musician and um, I write string arrangements. I've done lots of like trio and quartet string uh, arrangements written out part each part I've done horn arrangements um, I will go into a bigger studio with a an acoustic uh, with a band you know with mm -hmm. micing up the instruments too so it's not just here like I've decided to link up um, and I guess we'll talk about this later but I used to have a bigger studio before the pandemic uh, but I've now like I have uh, aligned myself with uh, other larger studios to be able to do these bigger things. So I quite enjoy that as well. Oh, it's good to have those avenues. I mean, I can see in your in your background, it's a very welcoming space. It looks like it's a very, uh, you know, just fosters creativity. Um, but, but, having, but having those options to go to a, a studio with a large live room to record drums, or if you need to do a live band, uh, it's good to be open-minded and be able to do that. 100%. Um, so, before we wrap up all of your musical background and and kind of where you got started, I'm interested to know, do you have any projects that maybe had some struggles during the project and, and ways that you overcame these challenges? I like, I generally, I'm not, I, I like to honor that each person like yourself, we've got our, our strengths and weaknesses and I'm my, I believe my strength is in the interfacing with the artist and creating a beautiful representation of their song in whatever genre uh, but sometimes you know it's hard to let go when you really have an, an idea of how a mix um, should go and um, I I don't like to I don't like to put more financial burden on an artist and you know my flat rate does include mixing but I will be uh, transparent that mixing is not my forte. Mm -hmm. I'm getting better at it all the time. And I, I think my mixes are pretty good, but, uh, a challenge I had recently was I'm like, Oh damn, there's like 120 tracks. And it's not just how many tracks is that there's like this frequency cluster in the center with all the different, the sonics of the different stuff. And I was like, you know what? I have to figure out how I can broach this with the artist to say, I think it would be better if we went to someone else. 
And um, so, you know, it was a bit of a tricky situation to, you know, after saying that, yes, I'll mix this, uh, but we worked it out. And, um, and I'm really glad we did because we got good results. So I guess how I overcame it was thinking in advance about the communications. And um, when a person, when a, an artist is already impressed with your faders up mix, the track is finished, there's a mix ish, and they think it's awesome. And I'm like, oh, no, it's not the best it can be. So it's really tricky to kind of articulate that without giving, you know, a whole bunch of references. And so I guess that's an example. But you know what, though, that is huge on your part and, and even creates more respect with you, with the artists that you work with as a, as a producer to be able to say, hey, I know this person might be better at this type of song than I am. Let's pass that off. Uh, now switching it back up, what is a project that you're particularly proud of that you've had the pleasure of working on? Oh my gosh, I'm so glad you asked that question. I mean, there's there's a handful right now, but in like I would say, top of it is Alicia Brilla's new album called Circle. Uh, amazing, three time Juno nominated Canadian artist. It's the quality of her writing and singing. It's the experience we had in the studio. It was so soulful and meaningful and real. And she's got both the skill as a singer and songwriter, as well as this deep connection to herself and, you know, her spiritual ways and uh yeah I mean we I did all the tracking I did all the vocal tracking here some acoustic instruments and she did all the mixing and they recorded some of the louder bigger instruments drum kit etc at a bigger place so the three of us were on a nomination a submission for a Juno nomination mm -hmm. as an engineering team we didn't make the final five cut, which I'm like, grr, we deserve to be there. Uh, for those who don't know, the Junos are like America's, like it's like the Grammys, right? Yeah. I'm proud of it because it's sonically beautiful because I really admire her craft and talent. Uh, it's an important message. It's um, a message about wellness and being independent there's a song called solitude it's pop music in it's pop songwriting but it's i would say it's more like roots with reggae vibe in it uh with sort of an, an r b honey voice like it's just beautiful music and i'm really proud of our work the way that we generated the way that we found the best case scenarios for her to deliver the kind of vocal she needed to deliver, including late at night, sitting on the floor of the booth, whatever was necessary. And I'm also very proud of it because we started, the idea was it was just before the pandemic hit in uh, March, early March, actually late February, 2020. She came to my last studio at the coach house and we just sort of did a little live off the floor track um, for fun and to see, you know, see how the vibe would go. And she's like, yeah, let's make this record. And we're like, woo, you know, and then everything shut down. So she, like many artists, I know there's so many people out there listening who it was heartbreaking to have an album ready to make and then release and then tour and then everything ground to a halt. So many people's releases have been delayed and her in particular, I mean, it was just heartbreaking but what came out of it was a record that had a lot of uh, a lot of depth and um, it's so rich and she's been touring. She just got back from Australia. She's been to Europe. Um, please look her up. It's A-L-Y-S-A, -A, Alicia. Okay. Y-S-H-A and Brilla, last name B-R-I-L-L-A, Alicia Brilla. So that's really cool, even just to be that close to being nominated for a Juno. And was that your uh, was that your closest call to that so far? Um, it, uh, the closest call in terms of like is, it was a Juno for engineering, right? Okay. So it's okay. very specifically about audio engineering, it's not production or songwriting or any of those things. So um, I did feel proud 
of it that it was up to the standard and yes it was the closest in terms of like um it wasn't myself putting myself forward because you can in Canada you can I mean I know there's academies sometimes it's based on sales but the engineering should really be about um talent and and craft um unfortunately it's still a very male dominated um sector of the industry and audio and so you know it's slowly shifting and changing but so that's why it was also a thrill to be on an engineering team of two women and one man in a a project that was uh, deeply satisfying to make and that I didn't have to put it I wasn't like hey this should win a Juno it was someone (laughs) else who was like you know doing that so that last bit you said there was actually a great transition into our next part that I want to talk about mm-hmm. because you used to run a program called the Her Studio, H.E.R. <laughs> Can you tell me a bit about that? Sure. Um, the acronym H-E-R came from um, trying to think of a way to uh, identify find myself as female, um, but it's and it's also the heroes is the H of small of forget the o heroes of engineering and record production so that that came about because i was very um i was just very chill doing my thing in my coach house studio for over 10 years and i don't know i just kind of like because i was in bands for so long i never really thought of myself as you know doing any worse than anyone else But I started to recognize that I didn't really know many other women, engineers and producers. I'm like, where is everybody? Wait a second. How do we find each other even, right? And it was right at a point where there was this just kind of burbling interest. And it was before the USC, the uh, university in Annenberg, University of California, in Annenberg started doing all this study. They did it for the film industry and they started doing it with the music industry. The percentage of um, gender inclusion in engineering, production, songwriting, performing. Of course, we see a lot more women artists performing, women songwriters achieving success, but in the production and engineering, especially in the engineering, uh, it's very low. And it's too long of a kind of, uh, uh, I guess, history of, uh, you know, women's studies, you could do a whole university program on why that is. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's not rocket science. It's basically um, society's uh, bias towards certain trades, like the way that you never saw female pilots for a long time. So anyway, what I had done was I stepped forward to do the first ever female producer panel wow. for... Wow. Canada's biggest national conference. And long story short, after two months of pro bono work, organizing this, them giving me the green light, bringing some amazing talent together, excited as all get out. And a week before they canceled on me. Oh, no. And this is what, but this is what let the, the fire under my butt to be, to launch her studio. So, um, Fortunately, I have friends in the industry, Uh, the president of Six Shooter Records up here in Canada, Shauna Descartier. I called her up and I'm like, ah, what do I do? She's like, meet me right now. Let's have some wine and talk about this and figure it out. And so she made some calls and organized a networking cocktail party thing that had would feature my panel. So we got to present it and a lot of people from the industry went and it was the just like the me too, which is thing was starting to come up and people were starting to become aware of like, oh yeah, women aren't really feeling seen or heard. And so after that um, happened, I was like, you know what, like maybe all these people might come out of the woodwork. If I just say it out loud, who knows? Right. So I gathered a few people together um, up here in Canada, we have this huge uh, national, I suppose they have branches across the country. It's a music store called Long and McQuaid's Music. Mm-hmm. And um, I was in their pro audio shop. And I had been thinking about how like, yeah, you know, panels, you know, panels are fine. And it's good. You feel some solidarity and you feel seen. But like, we need really like, you know, boots on the ground, like 
We need to develop skills. We need to develop community. And we need to know that each other exists. If we want to hire each other, we want to uplift and elevate each other and, and, and move the needle in terms of gender equity in the industry. We have to know that each other exists. So I just started to put the word out there. And I happened to be standing in Long McQuaid's and I was excitedly talking to someone and someone else overheard and offered that their company would sponsor it. And I'm like, what? So without having to do the whole, you know, six months of seeking sponsors and then it, like, I just was like, let's do this. Like it just on the seat of my pants for no money, enough money to like bring some people on board, to get some food, to book these VIPs. Uh, Karen Kosowski, who's now a really big deal in Nashville, was one of the producers. So it was a monthly series. Um, Hill Korkutis, who just won Engineering Juno last year, a great producer, also a couple records she worked on, uh, just won Juno's a couple of days ago, um, and Aaron Costello from the East Coast. So really high level women producers. They were booked for these uh, the monthly series. Um, each one was a different um topic so it was like building a track one was on vocal production one was on mixing and it was just thrilling because i had the space so i was like oh why don't we do something in a studio that where like people can get their hands dirty they can talk and they can network and a studio that we feel comfortable to be frank justin a lot of women in the business have felt harassed or intimidated or not comfortable in studios with some dudes. It's just the way I myself have experienced multiple situations of harassment and not just, I, I don't just mean like, oh, they don't respect my opinion. I mean, sexual harassment. So what I wanted to create um, a space where people could come in, we could do this informative workshop so they could learn some stuff and also meet each other. And it was like over the moon. Like we, the, we were jam packed. Like as many people as I could fit in, it was like 25 people squished in my studio. Um, the energy was amazing. People were so grateful and enthusiastic. And it just started this ball rolling. And I'm not running it right now. I have other things going on. But I do have to give myself a little cred, a little pat on the back. Because I'll give you another I, pat there. Thank you. <laughs> um, because I made that leap of faith and just you know, with a question, like, where are we all? I know there's more of us, more people like me out there. Um, then now it's trending. There's a huge organization, huge national organization with funding from banks and industry running a women and non-binary music producer national accelerator program. It's been going four or five years. I was in it myself. Wow, there's that's like incredible. Every Every time you turn around, there's another thing about women producers or female engineers. And so I just, I feel like, yeah, you know, the timing and the convergence of the need and the hunger for people. And so, you know, I do give myself some credit as the trailblazer. That's incredible because you said there weren't a lot of safe spaces and you created that safe space for other women to come in and feel safe and to be able to create together. Um, did any of these relationships? Uh, turn into musical adventures between you to where yes. you started musical projects with each other or, yeah. or, or anyone that you still are in touch with today? Absolutely. I, like it's only just growing and um, a few people became clients and a few people are now like, you know, have everyone's that, that is committed to their craft and, you know, even outside of the music industry, whatever it is that you are driven to spend your life and, and force energy and time and and the thing that gets you up in the morning that you love to do and want to do everybody from that time frame you know which would be what 18 like five years ago i see so many people that were at the her studio workshops having elevated their careers and like it's so satisfying so yeah i'm in touch with a lot of folks from then Everybody was there. It was a producer, it's a female non-binary producer workshop. And one of the things that I discovered was partly because we we haven't been taught, most of us as women, that we belong in studios and that we have a right to be there and we have good ideas and damn it, I'm going to say them out loud. 
um, is that we didn't really believe we were producers, even though we were like, let's say you were in a band, right? You're a female bass player playing in a band and you're in the studio and you're like, oh, hey, you know what? I think that the uh, transition into the into the next chorus, you know, like, why don't we kind of like, like, let's try this kind of a riff or let's, oh, you know, can we double up on that part? Like, those are all production choices and decisions if you're not heard, if you're if your opinion isn't welcomed or you get shut down, which is often the case, then you just kind of clam up and you think, oh, that's that mysterious, magical thing called a producer. And I'm not that. You don't know how I still to this day, how many women, non-binary folks I meet who don't believe they are also producers. So now I'm telling these younger artists like teenagers, you know, you're co-producing this track now, right? Like. You just helped me make the vocal comp. That means you're officially producing. Or you just chose that kick drum sound. You realize that's a production choice. So that they, as young people, can go, oh, yeah, I'm the singer-songwriter. I'm also co-producing. So, I mean, as you and I both know, nothing can be nothing can substitute for spending the 10,000 hours, the listening, the focus on the on the skills and how to create shape and distance and height and width and where everything needs to live. And so that doesn't come overnight. So I'm not trying to, you know, downplay it and say, oh, just because you decided on how long the reverb should be on that acoustic guitar, that means you're a producer, but it starts somewhere. And nobody gave me that space, even though I went to an audio engineering and production college, for God's sake. And actually it's funny because my prof there came up to me at the end of my first year, I was coming into second year and I still was winging it. And he was like, Hey, can you, can you meet with the first year women that come in? Cause like, you're so confident and like, you could really help them, you know, feel like, you know, confident in the studio. And I'm like, you think I'm confident? <laughs> it's just, it's bravado. It's just like being loud girl who has three brothers. I'm just like, you know, so sometimes it is based on personality, but the really like, even Lauren Hill, okay, was producing herself before anyone was calling themselves a producer. So we're out there. We have been out there. It's just that these terms weren't, mm, let's say the generosity of sharing that um, that role wasn't always there. The challenge and the something that you don't really learn until you've done it for years is that as soon as I'm hearing a song, like the raw form, the artist is sitting over there playing it for me, I'm pre-hearing what I'm going to need to do to help that song come alive. And sometimes those things that I suggest, they don't understand like, well, wait, why, why would we do that? Because and I'm like, trust me on this, like in a week you'll understand. <laughs> so, I mean, yeah, the, there are things that it, it isn't just choosing the sounds, you know? And as I said to someone the other day, I it was actually a question. I didn't say it. I asked it. I asked a question of one of my 18 year old uh, youth artists. I was like, she said something. Oh, we had a showcase and she announced oh, you know, who was producing the track. And so I said to her later, so how, how do you define a producer's role? In your mind, what does a producer do? And it wasn't a trick question. I really wanted to know first before I said. And she's like, oh, you know, you decide on like, you know, the tempo and the key. I'm like, yeah, yeah. What else? Oh, you know, the, the sounds and the, yeah, yeah, the sounds. So she was pretty much in the, she was right on all counts in the creative realm, but it is also managing and watching the budget, watching the clock, organizing the musicians, scheduling the musicians, choosing them and writing charts and sending MP3s to the musicians. There's overseeing the mastering. Like there's this whole component that until you've really produced a record from front to back, you don't realize, oh, there's all this other stuff. It's not the, necessarily the fun stuff. You know, I don't like staying up till two in the morning writing a chart because there's a session the next day and there's no chart. Um, but it's part of it. 
there's always things in any type of job where there's, there's stuff in the background that isn't the fun stuff to do. <laughs> but what uh, what is what is great about what you were saying, including even someone who made a small kick drum change, telling them that they are a producer on that is inspiring to that young artist in that own respect. Um, and it allows them to, you know, just grow their creativity even more. Um, and they start putting that producer hat on. And they go, oh, well, what other ideas can I come up with? And it helps us spark other interests like that. 100%. And you know what, Justin? I feel like I'm the person that I wished that I'd met when I was a teenager. You get to, to, to influence that onto other musicians now because stuff from the Her Studio kind of leads into LPM, Lisa Patterson Music, which is what you have going on today. Would you like to enlighten us a little bit with that? Ooh, yes, I would. <laughs> um, Thank you. 